Right, uh, uh, I think that we... All right, um, oopsie. I think we should start. Hello? Hello? <laughs> that was pretty effective. <laughs> um, I would like to uh, welcome the first speaker of the afternoon. And actually, I would like to say um, one of our speakers in the afternoon, uh, um, Joseph Grima, uh, cancelled. Uh, had to cancel his trip to London last moment due to an emergency. So I suggest that we have all four speakers and then at the end of the afternoon we have discussion with all the contributors and the audience. Um, I would like now to welcome our first speaker for the afternoon, Eve Lomax. Actually, I would like to welcome Eve back to the AA. She was here with us in uh, November and she did part of her readings uh, in front of a group of students and now she's back uh, to uh, give us some more pleasure of her readings. <laughs> Eva is, she's not an architect, she's a visual artist, she's an author and she's an educator. She's actually teaching uh, writing, arts writing at uh, Goldsmiths College and the Royal College of Art and has published also several books, primarily on writing. She's the author of Writing the Image, An Adventure with Art and Theory, Sounding the Event, Escapades in Dialogue with Matters of Art, Nature and Time, and Passionate Being, Language, Singularity and Perseverance. It seems to be quite focused on our topic today. So please welcome Eva. I think I'm the, probably the one today that um, doesn't write about architecture. Um, but I hope there'll be something in what I present to you, which are going to be extracts, which is what Maria asked me to do, from my writing. And I just call it beginnings, ends and middles as a way to give that sense of how the beginning of one thing becomes the uh, um, end of another and the middle of another. Um, and what I want to do is just touch upon how presupposition has become a kind of concern for me within my writings. Um, so that was a kind of little raison d'etre for me, choosing the writing, right? Um, and maybe there's a connection if I just say, can we build, can we architecture without presupposition? Right? So maybe if I just posit that question, um, we might have some interesting discussion afterwards. So, um, as I said, 20 minutes of extracts of reading. and. Um, Presupposition. Okay, here's the first time it appears. It's about 203, and it's almost the beginning of what would become published as Sounding the Event, Escapades in Dialogue, and Matters of Art, Nature, and Time. It's page eight, at the very beginning of chapter two, called A Twittering Noise. A lot of questions were hanging in the air, enough to fill a book. But there was one question that kept returning like a little refrain. And once again, she found herself asking if an event is going to happen, or has it already happened? Rather than the too early, is it now the too late? She said that she didn't know the answer, and I said, neither did I. All that could be done was to wait, and wait we did. And as we did, we found that questions began to arise. She asked if thinking, always has to be about something. And before I had time to think about my response, I said, thinking is something. Without a hint of sarcasm, swank or cussedness, she then said, I'm listening to you. And after a short pause, she repeated the words yet added, but in what way am I hearing you? And the question was answered by her asking another. Upon listening to you, will I only hear which I've already heard? Indeed, will I take back what you say to what I presume to already know? However, making this return, my ears become <coughs> plugged with presupposition, and that is not to listen to you. 
Presupposition seizes what you say before it is said, and that is to take the words from your mouth. I looked down, <coughs> held a breath, and then looked up. Plugged with presupposition, my ears do not hear what you say is something as yet unsaid. I hear only the already said and shut out the unspoken, the future that can't be said ahead of time. No matter what you say, I already know of what you speak. And so I kid myself that the future can be known in advance, but this is not to listen to you. This is to silence you. What is more, it to assume an already existing world, one that is complete, already built, and no longer becoming. How foolish to presume that I can know the future before it's becoming. Yes, how foolish to think I can control time. And, with a twinkle in her eye, she responded by asking ever more questions. It may be foolish to think that time can be controlled, but isn't it naive to think that we can hear without presupposition? How can I hear as if for the first time? But wait, why should I fear such naivety? To her question, I responded quickly by saying that to hear as if for the first time perhaps would be like music to your ears. I looked to her, and at the same time, she looked to me. Each waited for the other to speak, but the wait wasn't very long. There is the question of how I am to listen to you. However, this brings another question. How am I to look at you? I see you, but how am I looking at you? I see a twinkle in your eye, yet how am I to see this twinkle outside of all prior representations? Indeed, how am I to see without presupposition? Yet, this would be to see as if for the first time. It would be to wonder and remain open to what I can only call the surprise event. Yes, it would, it would be to see the twinkle in your eye as a glint of an event where something is coming about that hasn't already been spoken for. It would be to listen. And then a silence softly fell. Now I want to turn to the middle of a chapter called Happiness, which appears about halfway through um, my next book, or my latest book, which way around you want to think about it, called Passionate Being, Language, Singularity and Perseverance. However, before I give this extra extract, I think it's appropriate if I just sound a few words from the very beginning of this book, which some of them may have heard already or read already. Um, anyway, it says, to begin again, <coughs> you, you who are persevering and being, awake to a question stuck in your throat. You want to have the question ejected, and you sit up straight to do so. But you cannot spit the words out and have them heard spoken. You cannot throw the questions out of your mouth, and you cannot do so because the words themselves have not yet been formed. Putting into words can be a risky thing to do. Nonetheless, you're prepared to take the risk. And you're prepared to do so because you have a hunch that doing so is bound up with life, living itself. But now, in the present that is this morning, not a word is uttered. Your mouth is opening, open, but language is not yet, at least not yet, happening. Does the question, by lodging in your throat, presuppose the existence of language? Your voice keeps silent. And now I come to the next extract, which is on happiness. So often we say yes to something for the sake of something else. I'll do it because of. But with happiness, there is no such because. We say yes to happiness for its own sake, which is to say happiness has its own because. Happiness appears by the cause of nothing other than itself. It is, as old Aristotle once said, self-sufficient. Hearing these words said prompts me to say that what brings happy life to the world is a manner of rising forth that doesn't presuppose itself, doesn't remain below itself, but rather appears without reserve and stubbornly remains imminent to itself. I'm finding myself drawn to speaking of happiness, but does such happy talk mean that the activity of critical thinking has become stilled. However, raises this question, does ask, does ask me to question 
the presuppositions I hold concerning what it is to be critical. And perhaps such questioning is exactly what critical activity demands. Do not take anything as given, do not presuppose. If this is so, then I cannot presuppose that critical activity involves either being resolutely against something, I protest, or moaning about the way things are. Now, I would be the first to say that I can moan, and some days I can go on and on, so full of complaint. I will moan about the circumstances of my life, I will moan about this, and I will moan about that. And moreover, I'll join in with those who moan silently as they say, mustn't grumble. Am I about to criticise the moaner in me? Am I about to deliver an opinionated argument against moaning? But would this constitute critical activity? Would it constitute critique? This is a demanding question. Now, to be against something is perhaps what some would deem critical activity to be all about. Such activity may, may well endeavour to identify and challenge something that oppresses us. Know your enemy. Yet what happens here is that which we are against becomes taken as given. However, to take the criticised as given, to presuppose its presence before a word is said against it, is to leave it, funny enough, unquestioned. For sure, questions may be asked of it, but in itself it remains unquestioned. And to be left unquestioned not only lets the criticised to take itself for granted, but also for indifference to breed. Now, indifference arises when we can't be bothered to ask questions and become tired of living and thinking. And indifference finds a breeding ground when criticism becomes the activity of making a claim about something as a counterclaim to another claim. And as the claims and counterclaims go to and fro, what soon only matters is the battle between the claims. And when only this matters, each claim is not concerned with, becomes indifferent to, calling to question the presuppositions of its claim. And so the claims and counterclaims go on and on, and the criticism becomes endless. Oh, listen to the politicians. And there comes a point when you shrug, you sh shrug your shoulders and say, who gives a damn? And these words are the words of indifference. The activity of being critical has to question everything. It cannot be indifferent. It cannot take the criticised as given. It cannot take the critic as given. Moreover, it cannot take itself as given. In other words, it has to be total which is to say, no stone can be left unturned. Now, hearing these words said, which are the words partly of Gilles Deleuze, makes me hesitate and wobble before saying anything. They make me want to cry out, what can I say? What can I say? The one thing, however, that I can say, that is, if critical activity is to take place, it cannot be for the sake of something else. It cannot be, I'll do it because of which would mean that critical activity is put in the service of something that lies beyond it and escapes its activity. Again, it is a matter of no stone being left unturned. But embracing what is said here takes me and critical activity to an extreme place. And it is an extreme place for, taking pl for, the taking pl for in taking place, the activity of being critical has to bear the radical insecurity of questioning everything, including itself, and any cause that lies beyond it. But in this radical place, critical activity and happiness share something. And now to a short text that was published <coughs> in a publication called um, Academ Academy or Academia. It was about ideas of the classroom coming out of the institution and it was put together by Reet Rogoff at Goldsmiths College amongst other um, theoreticians and artists in Europe and my, my contribution was called, which is quite short I will, will give, give you now, was on bringing education to life. Um, I wrote this around about 2007. What for me is the most important thing to teach, indeed, 
What through teaching in art schools and elsewhere have I come to learn is the most important thing to learn. Today I know no other answer. Perseverance in questioning and exposing presupposition. To persevere is not to give up on finding out what a particular knowledge, theory or practice presupposes. And I would say that such an endeavour is what brings education to us. But I would also say that perseverance in questioning and exposing presupposition is what makes education a life, or to put it in another way, makes learning a life. So much in our lives makes us want to give up. We become tired of living and cannot be bothered to persevere. And that we can't be bothered means that we give, what we give up on is our desire. For perseverance does not happen without desire. Learning perseverance is learning nothing other than desiring one's desire. So the importance of learning to persevere is precisely that of having desire and learning touch and becoming interlaced. To persevere in questioning and exposing presuppositions, we do not give up on learning, which is to say, we do not give up on desiring desire. And in not giving up, my desire has the chance to experience its self-constitution as desire, as desiring. And this experience is what, to be a Spinozan, makes learning a joy. For Gilles Deleuze, it's precisely what constitutes a life. So to question and expose presupposition is to bear the ordeal of living a time in which taking something for granted is not possible. Indeed, it is to live in time which, in which one stands without knowledge, without an object of knowledge, which is when perhaps, as the philosopher Alain Badiou would say, a little hole, a subtraction, is being made in the known, or in other words, what constitutes knowledge. And for Padu, this little aside, that little hole is truth. And now a little short extract from a text that I wrote just before the publication of Passionate Being, but it was true quite heavily on the writing and research for that, for that book. And it was a, te it's a text called To Not Happen, and it was published in Parallax, but it's just a little short piece of it. Um, I hear Agamben say that there can be no true community on the basis of presupposition. A true community can only be a community that is not presupposed. No matter in what walk of life it happens, presupposition will always maintain concealment. With presupposition, when presupposition happens, what happens is the establishment of a before and a beneath. There comes a preposition that sets down anteriority and antecedents, and there also comes supposition, which sets down a place that is beneath, or, or in other words, hidden below. Now, presupposition gives me a before in time. However, it also puts into position a realm that is hidden below and as such concealed and separated from me. Let's say I'm about to write an autobiography. I'm poised, pen in hand. But before a word is penned, I find myself having to ask, does the I that speak in autobiography presuppose itself? The question halts me in my tracks. The autobiography is not written. It does not happen. And that is precisely what the likes of Giorgio Agamben wants, wants to happen to presupposition to not happen. What should be the philosophical task par excellence? Agamben says, the elimination and absolution of presupposition. <coughs> and hearing these words, I hasten to add, can humanity free itself from presupposition? Can it? Now my last reading, as an extract from a new work, and for the sake of a day, I'm going to call it, it doesn't really have a proper title yet, I'm going to call it A Philosopher, A Cat, and Nudity. 
So, standing in a doorway, a figure says, this voice is not mine. And as there has been no announcement of a proper name, the figure goes only by the pronoun he. I have no idea who he is and why he's standing there. Nonetheless, the words he utters pierces my hearing and forces me to stare. And as I look, I see that his left hand shoot out and then come back and slap itself against his mouth. The gesture seems to imply that he's gagging himself after omitting something he shouldn't have. What did I understand the least? What was said or what was seen? Would I be wrong to connect the two? And before I have a chance to attend to these questions, a cat appears in the doorway and sits squarely next to the left foot of he who's standing there. Looking neither to the right nor to the left, the cat's gaze is fixed straight ahead. What has this cat seen? It seems that the cat has appeared from nowhere, but believe you me, the cat sitting in the doorway is not just any cat. This cat, this living being that is called cat, is a cat that more than once has been seen by a philosopher who has seen himself stark naked by this very cat which he admits is female. <coughs> On each occasion, gazes intersect and the philosopher stands there with, in his words, his sex exposed. And each time it is an encounter, yes, let's call it an encounter, which brings forth the question, who is looking at who? To call out to the cat that is sitting in the doorway and staring straight ahead, I only have the name cat. I could change cat to pussycat or kitty, but would her ears perk up? Would she turn her head? Would she walk my way? With the protection of quotation marks, the philosopher says, my pussycat. And although he quickly follows this by saying, but a pussycat never belongs, I'm sure the philosopher would have called this his pussycat by another name other than pussy, cat or kitty. But this name that would be commensurate to the philosopher's proper name is prenom, whisper, shack, shack. Sim I simply do not know. And then without a sound being emitted by myself or the figure who is still holding his hand against his mouth, the cat turns and looks at me. I am being seen by a cat and what is more, the cat is addressing me. And in the moment of this address, which has not been brought about by a so-called human yelling at a so-called cat, I make no move to ready my tongue to say something. You could say the cat has got my tongue. However, I must say that it is not really a matter of a tongue being held. I stay silent, but for me there is no deprivation in doing so. And the longer the silence prevails, the more the situation becomes a matter of who is looking at who. The cat looking at the naked philosopher in his bedroom or bathroom causes embarrassment. The philosopher wants to shout out in protest against the indecency of finding himself naked before the cat that looks at him just to see. But he bites his tongue. The philosopher admits he's ashamed. And he also admits he's ashamed of being ashamed. Why the shame? It could be that the philosopher is making an anthropomorphic projection. The she-cat knows that the he-man has his clothes off. She knows his sex is exposed. She knows that being seen naked being a, can be a source of shame. Now, anthropomorphism gives with one hand and takes with the other. It gives the cat, what they call animal, a trait, attribute, or characteristic that is supposedly defining of human. Yet this that is given to the cat animal is precisely what is taken away from the cat animal as the specifically human becomes identified and raises its head. Anthropomorphism will put a cat in boots and let it walk in the upright position, that is, so they say, the human way. Anthropomorphism will let what is called human swap <coughs> places with what is called animal, swap places with what is called human. Yet trust in the categorization that gives rise to these very places is not, in the last instant, called into question. But in the moment of the naked philosophers encountering the cat's gaze, everything, including the temporality of the moment itself, is thrown into question. 
you could say that categorization has fallen down and taken the philosopher with it. Who is looking at who? What is looking at what? Simply put, he does not know who or what cat or self is. He cannot say other. He cannot say I. He cannot presuppose, and perhaps the cat, cat can't either. The cat sat in the doorway is looking at me, indeed, the living being that once upon a time men gave themselves the right and authority to name animal looks at me, and I am exposed before it. And with this exposure, let me stress I am clothed, there perhaps begins what the naked philosopher called calls thinking. And of course, I have to ask, thinking for whom, by whom, by what? That's it. for the Temporary American Center in Paris and since then has completed a number of buildings and has taken part in a number of urban design competitions and also in the design of public institutions and residential complexes in different places like Paris, Marseille, Beijing. And in the last uh, four years, Nasrin has been uh, acknowledged for the different forms of contribution to architecture by the ministry, Minister of Culture in France and also by the French Academy of Architecture. Please welcome Nasrin. And the title of her, I would like also to say the title of her talk, which is Das Bau d'Architecture, Reading Architecture. So from writing to reading. Thank you, thank you, Marina. It's so nice to be back. Even the, even it's, it's home, fun. it's being home. Yes. Yes. I'm still nervous. Why? I don't know. Be. Because of you. <laughs> and that's the quintessential figure of literature, you know, Virginia Woolf. I discovered her very late, actually, in my in my adulthood, probably, I should say. Uh, and I was just told, are you sure that's what she said? Nothing has really happened until it has been recorded. I'm almost sure that that's what she said. Uh, a few years ago, I was supposed to be giving this lecture, finally, in this uh, fantastic uh, sort of position in France, at the Cité de l'Architecture, you know sort of the Cité de l'Architecture has symbolically uh, an incredible moment in your life as an architect in France. And um, the only way that I could think of uh, my, uh, my presence within France in the past 25 years of my life was to see how I could actually bring another angle of vision to an institution uh, which is still infested with absolute sort of powers of 
Les Beaux-Arts. So I thought the only way that I could do it was through an English woman called Virginia Woolf. And that was through um, her fantastic seminal work of, um, which everybody knows, of course, and everybody has even read it as a textbook in school. What is this thing making some noise on there? It's a post-it. Uh, a room of one's own. So <laughs> through a room of one's own, I came to the uh, sort of to the conclusion that uh, we were dominated figures in architecture, whether we were women or men, and that through this domination, somehow one had to build up a critical position for oneself in order to be sort of away from this, from this domination somewhere. <coughs> so if we one minute just look at the significance of what it could mean to write things, you know. Writing could be informational. Uh, I think uh, Mario very eloquently um, this morning showed to us this, this sort of, uh, this, the capacity of writing both as information but also as a warning, but also as an image. Uh, and it could also be um, something that is absolutely, as I said, a piece of warning. Now, the sort of the, the superimposition of writing which actually makes some kind of an image becomes very important, especially in the work of architects. I'm not a writer, I'm not, I don't claim to neither be a writer nor a historian, but I do like good writing. And I do desire very good writing. Now, when about 20 years into my practice, I was asked for the second time to position myself and say something about architecture, I thought that it was very important to say that not through the projects, but through words and through words that become <coughs> extremely constructed and therefore they become writings. Uh, Dazibao, and not Dazibaos per perhaps, because Dazibao d'architecture in a way, and I don't want it to become sort of the, the literalness of pain and, uh, and sort of suffering of the Dazibao, but was a, was a very important um, way of allowing the public, and not only architects, to begin to be able to communicate, read, and not only understand, but read, and uh, put themselves within a very uh, specific position, which I call a critical position in architecture. Now, the reason that we had to describe within the exhibition that we were going to show and the exhibition that we were going to make of our projects, we had to describe what Dazibao was, was because of the fact that Chinese have a very, very specific relationship to Dazibao, be being, for some Chinese, a very important moment of not only discontent, but critical moment of the cultural history of the Chinese, and that it could mean for some Chinese a very painful moment of their lives. We called it Dazibao d'Architecture, this exhibition. It was because of the fact that we wanted to somehow describe architecture through a very different communicative mode than what the tools of architecture are. So in fact, we had these sort of, this is the entrance to the exhibition. The um, invitation, I specifically chose two plans or two drawings of um, a territory near Beijing which, uh, and I was showing through the two um, images that master planning could have different visions, not only one. It doesn't have to be one plan. But also, we were showing a very sort of a mysterious uh, image of what architecture could be and what an exhibition of architecture could be. So there were these sort of, let's call them bath curtains, if you like, or let's call them affiche posters that we were hanging in an exhibition in order for the public to be able to 
go through a series of our thinking in 10 years of our production of architecture. So these were the sort of the images that I'm going to show you just to see what the exhibition looked like. Now the exhibition was supposed to be sort of a moving exhibition and going from uh, city to city. Uh, however, it was going to be very different how one deals with words in different places. From Paris, it was easy because it was in English and in the, the, all the posters were written in English and in French. Uh, Rouen, we're still in France. When it went to China, it had a very different uh, meaning for, uh, for the Chinese, uh, even though everybody was reading both English and, and French. However, what was interesting was also to see the different um, ways that these posters were beginning to have a dialogue in the space that they were. Now, they went to China actually and they never came back, so we can't make it go anywhere else. Uh, I, I, had a, I had a very, very sort of um, brief conversation with Brett some time ago, saying that maybe they should come to the front members room, but they can't anymore, so you can just get to see them here, because they came back from China and they were completely uh, destroyed, uh, because DHL apparently uh, sublets and sort of subcontracts uh, sending stuff from China and therefore it doesn't go through DHL. So when they arrived back to Paris they were in pieces. So um, let's start with this sort of um, suggestion. Yeah? Architects often forget that critical thinking depends on exposure and that the simplest form of debate must start with a proposition. Dazibao d'architecture exposes our work as a series of declarations and propositions, open to criticism and debate. We believe that criticism is an essential interface that allows the architect to engage with the greater public. Somewhere in the 70s and the 80s, architecture lost its conviction, its capacity for political activism, and its power. It rose to stardom in the 90s, and when architects became as well known as pop singers, everyone started to desire architecture. Perhaps it is time to stop abusing the power of architecture and allow it to become, once again, a platform for criticality, social awareness, and political engagement. We still believe in the power of architecture to make environments that allow us to inquire, measure, and determine our active position in society. Dazibao d'Architecture proposes a voyage through the most condensed periods of our practice of architecture in the past 10 years. Days of total disappointment, hours of extreme joy, and moments of radical thought. The life of an architect. Now, it was very important to, um, to see how we were going to put these things together. So, this model basically shows you the space of the gallery in, in, in Paris and how a series of these um, the, the thoughts had to somehow come together under some specific themes. I'm not wanting to really put this in any parallel to the way that one deals with chapters in a book, but it's very important, it was very important for us to see what was it that we were going to be saying in terms of each project. So, the projects were divided into uh, sections, and the sections such as ground plane, public realm, urban transformers, geography, time and perception, observing topography, repetition and difference, constructing a site, education of an architect, platforms, city in section, were allowing a series of our projects to fall into these moments that were the thoughts or the thinking that we had onto the, on, on, the, on these projects. I'm going to take you through one of them, and then maybe we'll just very quickly go through some others, and just dis I will describe or I will try an attempt to show you how and why we had picked out the way that we decided to show these projects. <coughs> so, the first poster, is supposed to be having a family of projects under it. So it's the avant-propos, or it's the, 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 the first page uh, of the portfolio, in a way. Yeah? 
Ground and the building's relationship to, its, to it are difficult questions in architecture. The modern movement, and specifically Le Corbusier, saw the ground as a new surface that needed to be liberated. Freeing the ground plane allows the building to hover over a stable surface. Our society of spectacle, obsessed with the monetary value of things, has transformed this idea into a cowardly debate on property ownership. Who does this ground belong to? The moderns took the ground and put it on the roof so that the inhabitants could appropriate it. The toit terrasse, or roof garden, shift the public domain to a private and controlled leisure space. If we follow Gideon's chronology, um, uh, which classifies Utzon in the fifth generation of the moderns, Kulhas belongs to the sixth generation, and we belong to the seventh. In the Sydney Opera House, the ground, even if artificial, finds another status. The podium becomes a singular moment of articulation between geography and architecture, which floats above the constructed ground. 